I'm here to talk to you about designing Intel for DNS and in particular, why a more is more strategy will fail you when using DNS to protect your networks. I'm Renee Burton. I'm the head of threat intelligence at Infoblox and we specialize in DNS intelligence specifically. So in this talk, we're gonna start with talking about DNS as a security protection layer. We're gonna handle that very briefly and then talk about various types of threat intelligence, regardless of how they're used. The way in which threat intelligence is gathered is fairly standard across all security products. And we're gonna talk about what's special about DNS and why you have to be aware of those variations and how they impact the security of your network and the impact on your network in DNS, how it's different from other types of security products. Then we're gonna look at how we actually design Intel for DNS and what it takes to do that very well. And then finally, I'm gonna give you five questions to ask your DNS Intel provider to ensure that you're getting the most protection for your network. So let's start first with DNS as a security service. So what do I mean there? Well, there's a variety of terms that are used. At Infobox, we say DNS detection and response. Other people might say DNS firewall. And a number of governments have made the term protective DNS very popular in the last couple of years. What we mean by that is we're using DNS um, block lists, domains and IP addresses as they're being resolved through the normal resolution chain for DNS, which is the first part of your network connection. And uh, we are blocking or logging, applying various types of policies to those domains or IPs. So when we talk about DNS threat intelligence, what do we mean? Well, that's the content of those DNS detection and response or protective DNS systems. It's the block list. It's the things that contain the domains and IPs that are really important to ensure that your network and your employees or customers are protected. When we talk about different types of threat intelligence, there are a few different philosophies that are used. One way is to aggregate data. And this is the more is more strategy. The idea is if I take threat intelligence from a variety of different sources and I compile them together, then I have more. And as a result of having more, I must be more protected. That's a extremely common and it's fairly easy to implement. You don't actually do the intelligence yourself. You derive it from other people and you union it together. And there are a lot of threat aggregators. In fact, there are a lot of people who are proud threat aggregators in the security community and including in DNS specifically. Curation is the next level of maturity for threat intelligence. And in the case of curation, you're kind of using this danger Will Robinson. You know that just aggregating data together is likely to cause you problems, particularly when you're applying it in DNS. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The curation strategy takes a lot more maturity. You have to understand your data and how it's being applied in different networks. And so it requires a more sophisticated understanding of the network and how the security appliance impacts the network. The third type of threat intelligence is creation. So this is your roll your own strategy. It's extremely difficult. You really need to understand the networks and the impact on the networks of your intelligence to ensure you're maximizing that protection. Most people do not create their own or they create a very limited amount of intelligence. Uh, it, again, independent of security products, but particularly within DNS, which is a very difficult subject to master. So what are common sources, whether it be for aggregation, curation, or creation? Common sources for intelligence that's used in a DNS security product in protective DNS, DNS detection response, malware samples are probably one of the most common what you do with a malware sample is you put it in a sandbox, you look for strings, and you extract the domains and IP addresses that it's reaching out to, and you use those as indicators. Another really common source of threat intelligence that's used in DNS security products is URLs. So there are a number of threat intelligence providers that focus on URLs. They crawl them, they have proxies, they use spam. And the domains from those URLs, which are typically phishing URLs, will be put into DNS block lists and used in security products. We also see incident response indicators being used from an attack after a compromise. Again, the IP addresses 
that contacted and attacked the IP addresses that attacked the network or the domains that it reached out to. Another source is IP scanners. There's also honeypots, registration data, routing tables, DNS queries. There is just a large number of sources, but the primary ones that you see in the market in terms of threat intelligence are going to be generated from malware, uh, URLs, or um, some kind of DNS-based data with registration or DNS queries. Now, if you take that threat intelligence and you're thinking about it generically, either aggregate, curate, or create, and I use one or many sources to create that intelligence or to generate that intelligence. When I look at how I'm gonna apply that to DNS, it actually ends up being a double-edged sword. So in the case of DNS, I'm able to block threats prior to the compromise. And that's completely independent of the operating system or the device or the type of attack because it's happening at the DNS layer, which is very early in the communication and in the connection to the network. So I give a lot of power from that. On the other hand, it is early in the chain. So it is extremely easy to disrupt or lower degrade the performance of a network by blocking a popular domain or one that you didn't even know was popular, but was important to the network. So what we find is that context really matters. In particular for DNS, you need to have indicators that are related to DNS and that matter within DNS. Otherwise you're going to disrupt that balance between protection of the network and performance of the network. We're always trying to balance protection and performance. The coverage matters. You really want to have um, coverage of threats that you can see within DNS. There's a lot of threats that are not visible outside of DNS. So when you limit yourself to malware generated threat intelligence or to URL generated intelligence or to incident response or to honeypots, you're limiting your visibility into everything that DNS sees. DNS is so early in network communications that it sees everything. The timing also matters. So malware centric threat intelligence by its very nature happens after the malware was discovered. In that case, devices, sometimes a few, sometimes many were already compromised. They may have been compromised for weeks, days, months, years before they're discovered. So the timing of malware centered threat intelligence means that you're doing threat intelligence for things that already happened. In DNS, we're trying to prevent the threats before they happen. So the timing of your intelligence in relation to the queries really matters a lot. Creating Intel that's designed for DNS is balancing this performance and protection. We want to protect the network as much as possible while ensuring that the network has the high level of performance needed to support its customers. So when we talk about designing Intel for DNS, it's important to understand what can go wrong. This can really help you in a decision-making process. What we found are that the three most dangerous sources for Intel are URL data, malware data, and incident response data. This is based on our years of expertise and looking at billions and billions of DNS queries. So URL data is very often on shared hosting providers, and in many cases, maybe on content delivery networks that the Intel provider isn't familiar with. So when they take a URL, which in fact may be phishing, and they reduce it down to a domain, they're reasonably likely to instead block an important service for the network. And this is something that we actually see all the time from URL-based intelligence. The second problem is fairly similar. When you look at malware-based intelligence, Frequently that comes from exploding a piece of malware within a sandbox and seeing what domains and IP addresses it connects to. Well, malware actors are smart. They know that that's what you're doing. They're doing a variety of things. They're trying to check for network detection and they're also trying to ensure that you don't detect them. So a lot of malware calls out to important and common services. And as a result, you will find in malware-based Intel very common domains. If you look up 
Google on virus total, for example, you will see that it is marked as malicious by a large number of vendors. The third one is incident response. The primary problem with incident response is it's generally not relevant to DNS at all. And that's largely because the attackers are usually coming from a network IP address that doesn't resolve to a domain and isn't part of DNS. But sometimes it has the same problems that URL and malware data does in that there'll be a domain that is actually important for the network. If you block these domains, you will have a problem. And so when you take an aggregation strategy, you tend to aggregate in particular, these three popular sources for block lists. In doing so, aggregation is very likely to cause a problem with your network performance. So what could go right with designing Intel for DNS? I mean, the opportunity for DNS based security is huge. It occurs before any network connection has happened. It can block things before they are known to anyone. They are able to see threats that are not seen in malware or in URL based Intel. So they have accuracy that is specific to DNS. They give you this visibility that can't be seen elsewhere and that you have the opportunity for what some people like to call pre-crime. I'm able to do this independent of the malware, independent of the operating system and before it was known and before it happened. So I'm able to maximize performance. If you do DNS Intel right, it is absolutely very important part of your security stack. So what are those pieces that we need in order to do DNS Intel right? It's very similar to the data science uh, diagram that you frequently see. For you to have good DNS-based Intel, you need expertise in threat intelligence. You need to understand the threat landscape and how it manifests in DNS. You need to be experts in data science. DNS is by its very nature, a big data problem. And so if you don't understand data science, you are not going to be effective at large scale DNS threat intelligence. You need to be experts in DNS. DNS is known to be an extraordinarily arcane topic. Subject matter experts argue frequently about what is the correct response from a DNS resolver for a specific query. And there are thousands of pages of documentation. Understanding what a DNS query looks like and what is the proper response is critical to being able to provide strong threat intelligence to be used within a DNS environment. And the last thing is you have to have visibility in DNS. You cannot create good threat intelligence that's going to be used in DNS without large scale visibility to DNS. Okay, that's how we design DNS Intel and um, how we believe it needs to be done in order to do it effectively. So takeaways for you, right? Aggregation, curation, and creation. Creation is extremely hard, but the best, most effective way to protect your network. Aggregation is the easiest thing for your Intel provider to do and the most likely to cause you problems. Now, if we look at what are five questions that you can ask an Intel provider for DNS detection and response to apply to your network. First, ask them, what is that balance between aggregation, curation, and creation that you have in the intelligence that's going to apply to my network? You're looking for an answer that is not solely aggregation. <laughs> Ask them, what is your false positive reduction strategy? So even the best of us are going to have problems with false positives. This is just the nature of big data. So you need to have a really robust false positive strategy. At Infoblox, we dedicate a significant amount of staff hours just understanding DNS how it lies within our customer networks from a statistical perspective so that we can ensure that we have as little negative impact from false positives on our customers as possible. Anyone providing Intel should have a robust false positive strategy and should be able to articulate exactly what that strategy is. Ask them, how do you ensure that your Intel is relevant to my organization? There are a variety of answers to this kind of 
question, and I encourage you to see what they have to say. For us, we focus on DNS. That's what we do. We are ensuring that our Intel is relevant to our customers because we leverage everything that comes through our resolvers to, to create better intelligence, and we specialize in this topic. What's your team's expertise in DNS? If the provider is not an expert in DNS, the likelihood for you to have a negative impact from that intelligence increases dramatically. This is all we do. That's what we focus on. We're not trying to <laughs> reverse engineer malware. We are not trying to web crawl URLs. We're focused on DNS intelligence. And then ask them about a threat that is uniquely visible in DNS. They should be able to tell you a story, a story that's compelling and that is not based on malware or URLs or an incident response. And if they can't, I would turn heels and walk away. Ask me. Go ahead. Ask me.